right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first stop on our cross, or sorry, the second stop on our cross Canada exploration in partnership with Edwin. So over the next few weeks, we're taking you on six incredible virtual journeys across the country to meet amazing scientists and conservationists who are protecting our wild places uh, and animals. You have our bonus trip, our seventh secret trip coming up live from the field. We will hope to see everybody there as we end things uh, in style with that bonus expedition. So my name is Joe Grabowski and I will be your host for this series. I run an organization called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So we bring science, exploration, conservation and adventure live into classrooms across North America through virtual speakers and field trips. If you haven't visited our site before, exploringbytheseat.com, you can find 30, 40, sometimes even 50 live events each month. You can join with your classrooms and always free for classrooms everywhere. So we had a great group joining us on our first stop to British Columbia uh, with Siobhan Darlington. We learned all about the amazing project she's working on in British Columbia with the cougars or mountain lions. We learned all kinds of different names for them, ghost cats and things like that. We learned that Scary Cat is definitely not one of them. So if you did miss that event, there is a playlist. I will share the link afterwards and you can check out that event from Monday if you happen to miss it. So today we are moving to a different part of Canada. We're going to spend a little time with Jill Heinerth. She is a world-class cave diver and water advocate with over 30 years of filming, photography and exploration projects. Uh, in submerged caves around the world with National Geographic, NOAA, educational institutions, television networks all over the world. She was the first explorer in residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and the recipient of Canada's prestigious Polar Medal and the Diving World's highest award from the Academy of Underwater Arts and Sciences. So I'm going to bring Jill in live with me right now. Hey, Jill, how are you doing today? Hello, just great. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> All right, Jill, it's great to have you with us. Our classrooms are joining us from across the greater Toronto area today. Mm -hmm. Some of them are already saying hi in the chat, so don't be shy. Use that chat sidebar, say hi, send your questions in that chat when the time comes. But for now, we're going to let you take over for a bit, Jill. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm uh, reaching you today from the capital region, which is the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee and Huron Wendat people. But even more important, I want to introduce you to a new word, and here it is it's Benagame. Benagame. And that is an Anishinaabe name. And that was a word that was gifted to. Um, a project that the Royal Canadian Geographical Society is working on um, that's respecting and doing some outreach on our shared responsibility to the Great Lakes. And Benagame is a word that means the water is clean. And it also gives you um, uh, a connotation of, of a, a, a spirit of participation in keeping that water clean and the feminine spirit, the women's responsibility, especially to be water keepers. So that's binagame, really interesting word. So a little bit about me first. I am a full-time underwater explorer and cave diver and explorer in residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So I actually learned to dive in Tobermory, Ontario. So, uh, you know, three, three and a half hour drive from where you are right now. And here there's some amazing shipwrecks right underneath the surface. And as I travel around the world doing my work underwater, I'm usually carrying a big camera system to take photographs or video. Um, but some also some pretty exciting life support equipment um, that makes me look a little bit more like an astronaut than a scuba diver. And over the past 30 years, I've used that equipment to do some pretty exciting dives, some you know deeper and further into caves than any woman in history and into places that nobody has ever been before, places where perhaps nobody else will ever get to see other than me. And on my work, I collaborate with a lot of different um, scientists in different environments, becoming their eyes and hands in these very remote places and with some pretty cool animals like uh, these ones on the West Coast. Um, 
So my work means that I have to carry a lot of equipment around as I go, and uh, sometimes by plane, sometimes by other more unusual means of transporting my gear. But again, into some really unusual environments, like within this bloom of jellyfish or underneath the Sahara Desert, where yes, there is water there too. I even go diving inside uh, extinct volcanoes inside the lava tubes inside those volcanoes um, and even to far away places as far as you can go from where we are today like Micronesia or closer places like in Canada where we dive on wrecks in Newfoundland. So I'm pretty fortunate to be able to go to some pretty beautiful places but I'll tell you if I could only dive in one place for the rest of my life it would be Canada. I live in this uh, very rural area of the Ottawa Valley, more specifically in Carleton Place. And Carleton Place is a place of water. The Mississippi River is out back. It's Canada's Mississippi, not the other Mississippi that we hear a lot more about in the United States. So I have a pretty nice backyard all year round. And in this area, we have a lot of mills. So we have a lot of dams and waterfalls and mills where people ground grain in the past. Here outside of my backyard, I could even go diving in the middle of winter. So not just the Mississippi River, but the Mississippi River drains to the Ottawa River. And along the shores of the Ottawa River, sometimes we see people doing some pretty interesting little uh, art projects with uh, with natural uh, supplies. Um, but here, right inside the city limits of Ottawa, we have some beautiful places like this Hogsback Falls, part of the uh, Rideau system. We even have a trail that goes down along the Rideau Canal. The Rideau Canal is the canal that connects Ottawa with the Kingston area and used to be very, very important for transporting um, goods quickly um, and out of harm's way. So diving, swimming, we have water everywhere from Lake Meach in Gatineau Park, just north of me, where uh, people, uh, friends of mine, just did a polar bear dip. And I uh, stayed in my equipment to do, uh, to do some dives. Uh, but we even do ice diving. And this is an unusual one because you could see that we had to take an ax with us because it was such a cold day. We wanted to be sure that the hole that we were diving through would stay open so we could get out. Now we have lots of wildlife in the region as well, and people don't necessarily think of Ottawa as a black bear region, but in fact, I even saw a black bear in the uh, suburbs of Ottawa, um, and I was quite surprised because I was riding my bicycle. Outside my back door, we see um, beaver right here at the dam that's in my backyard. And I love this little cute one of him sitting on his tail. Uh, but bird life, we have an amazing migratory corridor through here and get just a never ending change of bird life, like this cedar wax wing here, or herons down in the river, or these days, lots of Canada geese are returning from their winters to, uh, to spend the summer with us. We even get deer, this one peering in the window. <laughs> Now, one of our local um, dive spots is Morrison Quarry, just on the uh, Quebec side, just outside of Ottawa. And this is kind of a cool place. Some of you could have been zip lining or um, bungee jumping there in the past. But underwater, you'll see that there's lots of things that have been placed underwater as sort of, you know, artificial reefs or, you know, sites where we can go do some training and look around. Even an airplane underwater that you can even swim inside of and some other unusual things you wouldn't expect to see underwater. Now, just south of us, we go down into the Great Lakes and the edge of the St. Lawrence, and we see shipwrecks. There are lots of shipwrecks, um, both in the lakes, in the Great Lakes, like 35,000 ships went down in the Great Lakes, um, thousands that we know the location of and can even go diving on today, and the same with the St. Lawrence. Some of them even partially stick out of the water. And so you don't even have to necessarily be a diver. You can actually go and see them from the surface or swim over them snorkeling. Now you'll see on this shipwreck here, there's a lot of stuff all over it. Those are zebra mussels, tiny little shells. 
And they have come, they're an invasive species. They've come all the way from the Caspian Sea and they cover many of the shipwrecks in the Great Lakes today. So they're not a good thing. They haven't been healthy for the environment. And we see a lot of them on the shipwrecks, um, both in the St. Lawrence and in Lake Ontario. And here's one of those shipwrecks that sticks right out of the water, the Wee Hawk wreck that sticks out of a lock. Part of the St. Lawrence near me was actually drowned um, many years ago to create the, the navigable waters of the St. Lawrence River. So you can look this up, but it's an amazing, amazing story in and itself where we had to flood many villages and move entire towns in order to make that a navigable waterway for large ships. Now, today you can also go to a place called Brockville, and that's um, just at the beginning of, uh, after the outlet of uh, Lake Ontario and the beginning of the St. Lawrence. And at Centene Park, we have a scuba park where a lot of people train. And there are underwater sculptures that have been placed so that we have cool things to swim around and look at underwater. And every year they change as things grow on those underwater sculptures. But there's also some outlet pipes um, that drain into the river there, and uh, and some of those are full of of fish. But I love the sculptures. I think they're uh, they're pretty interesting. Now we also have trash in um, the Great Lakes, and so it really is important to us to remember that just because it's out of sight doesn't mean it's healthy. So I find a lot of things underwater. I do a lot of underwater trash cleanups so that that's not left underwater. So some of the work that I do is actually up in the Ottawa River um, and it's pretty interesting. I work with scientists there um, that are interested in studying mussels or bivalves. Um, now around the Ottawa River, it's pretty interesting. Like uh, topside, some of you may have been to Gatineau Park and been inside of Lusk Cave. So there are places that water has carved cave conduits in the rock. But we also have caves underwater. And this is the Gervais Three Island Cave, which is Canada's longest underwater cave at about 10 and a half kilometers. And inside this cave, I've discovered that it's full of life, like more density of life than I have seen anywhere in a freshwater cave. So bivalves, mussels, shells, that's what you're seeing there. And the little spaghetti-like stuff, those are sponges, freshwater sponges. So they all stay in place and feed by filtering nutrients out of the water. So here's a mussel that's actually filter feeding and boom, that was a mussel sneeze. So it's just sort of pushing water out of its siphons to kind of clear the way and then it can filter feed more of the stuff that's just drifting through the fast water. So it actually sucks in and spits out water through apertures or siphons. One goes in and one comes out and that's how it gets its food. And that's what a filter feeder means. So it can feed or two, or it can filter feed two liters per hour. And so you can imagine that that's a lot of water it's filtering, considering it can live one to two hundred years each shell. And the shell will also have some other great beneficial effects. Like they do actually move in the soft sediment, and they kind of stir up the sediment like an earthworm would. So. There's another cool thing, whoops, like that, um, that the mussels are doing, and I'm gonna show you how that works. We think of them as what we call the livers of the rivers, because they're cleaning the river by filtering. And it, since they live so long, they obviously need to reproduce. And it turns out that in some species, there are both males and female mussels, and the males can send their sperm into the water for the female just to randomly collect. And once she does and starts to grow babies, literally, like that's a pregnant female mussel, that little bulge in the center is full of little microscopic babies. She also starts to grow a fishing lure, which is kind of cool. And she's starting to do that in that picture up there. And she takes that fishing lure and she vibrates it in the water, just like a fisherman does. And it attracts bass to swim over top. It's kind of like bait. So the bass comes into the mussel, nips at the bait, 
And when he, when the bass does that, then the muscle blows its young into the mouth of the fish. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but what happens is that then the little baby shells, like their hinge shells, they latch onto the gills of the fish or the fins of the fish, and they actually act like little vampires sucking from the blood of the fish. But they're so small that it doesn't hurt the fish. And when the fish grows up a little bit and its immune system gets wise to the fact that it's got hitchhikers, it ejects them and they bury themselves in the silt for a couple of years before they grow up um, and become juveniles and start that job all over again. So this is a picture of that lure on the plain pocketbook muscle, and it looks just like a fish with an eye, but it's growing out of an animal that doesn't even have a brain or eyes. So pretty cool. So we search um, for mussels both in the river and in the cave, and we identify the different species. We actually count different species of mussels and sort them out as we do so. And sometimes it's in pretty low visibility. But as we count all of these mussels and measure them, then that gives us a sense of how healthy the river is. But we also catch fish in the river with scientists and we um, bring the fish on board just for a few minutes. And this is a baby sturgeon here that Tim Haxton, the scientist has just caught. And we put it in a trough for a moment upside down here and the trough has some water in it. And we actually look in the gills of the fish with a, micro, or with a microscope or with a hand lens so that we can see if there's any of those little baby shells stuck in there. And we do find them. So these animals, like shells, these mussels are pretty cool. And as you can see, you know, this is a black sand shell mussel and he's vibrating that little lure to attract a fish. So they're pretty amazing animals with a pretty cool ability to um, think outside the box for reproduction and continuing because all that muscle has to do is replace itself once every 20 to 30 years to continue the population that's doing an amazing ecosystem service by filtering the river and fil by filtering the Ottawa River, then you will also help the health of the St. Lawrence Seaway that it leads to and then even the ocean that is beyond. So I think this is a really good place for us to open up and answer some questions that you might have. All right, Jill. Well, thank you so much for sharing that amazing mm. journey with us. There are so many places we can dive and explore right here uh, in Ontario. Uh, you don't always have to go to the tropics and the coral yeah. reefs. Sounds, sounds looks like there's a lot to see right here. Mm hmm. All right. Very cool. Well, classroom, start to get your questions ready and you can put those into the chat. We are going to play a little Kahoot now. So just give me a moment here uh, to pull the Kahoot up. It is ready to go. And then I am going to share it uh, on the screen here. So as a reminder, we are going to head to Kahoot.it. You may be doing this on a device at your desk. You may be doing this on a device at home if you're in a virtual school or your teacher may pull it up at the front of the classroom for you. Uh, and you can join that way and shout out your answers. So let me share my screen and let's get this going. Preparing the Kahoot, that looks good. Okay, so there we go, Kahoot.it. And then you wanna go to 9511276 when it asks you for a pin number. If you are using a tablet or a phone, you could even scan that little QR code and it will bring you right in there. So I'll paste that link into the YouTube as well so that we can find it there a little bit easier. So you'll see the link is there, uh, kahoot.it, and then use that pin number uh, and we'll get things going. Start sending your questions in via the private chat. There we go, the students are starting to join, the classrooms are starting to join. Mrs. Otello's grade fives are telling me they have questions ready to go already, so that's always a good sign. Uh, so Jill, let's, um, while we're waiting for mm -hmm. the, it's a slow down. We've got lots of people joining right now. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your last expedition. Where were you last? What was your last expedition? Yeah, I, I just recently came back from both Micronesia and the Poor Knights Islands. Oh. So Micronesia, um, I was down in Truck Lagoon, a place where in World War II, uh, the, the Japanese fleet was sunk 
um, by allied aircraft. And so there's a whole bunch of shipwrecks underwater. It's very warm water and they're covered with life. They're very, very beautiful. And then from there, I went on to New Zealand to the poor Knights Islands um, that are just offshore, kind of north of Auckland. And they are incredibly beautiful because the currents from the Coral Sea come down there and mix with colder water and create some very unique life. So it's a, a UNESCO um, World Heritage Site um, protected because of the beautiful biodiversity there. All right. Oh, it sounds absolutely, absolutely amazing. Very mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to have to ask you another question because there yeah. are still students pouring in. Yeah. Uh, we we want to give them a chance. This is new for a lot of the classrooms as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, they're just kind of getting in. So you mentioned that the, the finding those muscles in the river can be a really good indication of mm. a healthy river because mm -hmm. they're, they're yep. reproducing, they're keeping the waters clean. Have you found some parts of the rivers where you haven't found those muscles and it's correlated nicely with the health of the river showing? Well, what's interesting is those zebra mussels that I showed you on the Great Lakes shipwrecks, they also filter the water, but not in a good way because they come from another part of the world and they weren't, they weren't ideal for kind of supporting the biodiversity of the Great Lakes. So they they reproduced really effectively they did filter the lakes making the water look clearer but they ate a bit too much and they also out competed the native mussels so it's the native mussels that are really really helpful and in that piece of the ottawa river where i'm working there's a 141 kilometer long stretch in between two dams and we don't have any zebra mussels there yet and so because of that, the native population is doing really well and doing a really good job taking care of the river. And we hope to keep the zebra mussels out of that part of the river and keep it all healthy. All right. Well, we've slowed down on the joining. So I am going to get the Kahoot going live right now. Uh, a few stragglers are popping in, but I think we are ready. So a reminder, I cut it down. It's not 30 seconds today because we have one under our belt. It's 20 seconds for each question. So try and get that correct answer in as quickly as you can. And that will get you more points and bragging rights of being in one of the top three spots on the podium. So here we go. Question number one coming your way. This is a true or false. Jill's explored places no one has ever been before. And is that true or is that false? Jill's explored places that no one has ever been before. And this might test some of the thinking that people have. There's this myth that we've explored and discovered everything there is to see it uh, on our planet, but that couldn't be further from the truth and absolutely true. Jill has explored places no one has been before and maybe no one will follow afterwards. Pretty amazing. <laughs> okay, our scoreboard. The agent wildcat is holding down that top spot. Let's jump to another question here, a little multiple choice. What are some places Jill has been diving? Lava tubes. Rex in Canada, underwater, oops, spelling mistake, underwater springs, or all of the above? What answer are you gonna lock in there? Lava tubes, Rex in Canada, underwater springs, or all of the above? All right, all of the above is absolutely right. And Jill, you've done some incredible diving into the places in our planet where our drinking water is. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to dive mm. in those springs and into that groundwater, that drinking water? Yeah, I, I feel like it's a bit of a spiritual undertaking in a way, because I'm swimming through the veins of Mother Earth, which means I'm literally in your drinking water. So mm. if you drill a well from the surface, you might punch right into the cave that I'm swimming into. And there are a couple of places that I know of where I can literally swim up to someone's well pipe and I can knock on the pipe. And I just wonder if they can hear it in their house. Uh, but what it means is that I'm seeing that water that's coming out of a spring and that spring might feed um, a, 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 both a spring basin and then a small creek and a river and then an estuary, which is the place where fresh water meets salt and where we have like a nursery of fish just erupting to populate the ocean. So everything's connected, right? From wherever you live inland to the ocean. And uh, so whether I'm swimming through your drinking water or not, that water needs to be protected as if you were going to have to drink it. All right. 
So we had some shift in the lucky gecko has snagged that top spot. Let's go to another quiz question. Zebra mussels are an invasive species in the Great Lakes. Where did they come from? Was it the Adriatic Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Caspian Sea, or did they come from the Pacific Ocean? Oh, it's getting Where tougher. <laughs> did those zebra mussels come from? You had to be paying attention to that uh, when Jill mentioned that to see mm -hmm. if we can snag that correct answer. It's a tough one. All right. Most students Ooh. was split, but most students went with the Caspian Sea. And I think the, you know, the, the ballast of ships, when ships take in some water uh, into their ballast tanks before they head across the ocean, then they empty them when they get into waterways like the St. Lawrence or the, uh, the Great Lakes, then those zebra mussels, those larvae can get in and, 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 and be there. And I've, I've been on wrecks like the Wexford in uh, Lake Huron, and it's just covered in uh, those those zebra mussels. All right. That shifted things. The elated hare has stolen that spot, but who is going to take it with our final true and false? Mussels are known as the lungs of a river. Is that true or is that false? Mussels are known as the lungs of a river. I just thought that was so... That What an amazing way to reproduce is having... Yeah the young larva uh, or the young shells actually in the gills and, and getting nutrients from there. It's absolutely wild. Uh, oh, we tricked a lot of students. We talked about the liver of the river because they are uh, filtering. filtering that water. Like the liver filters blood from toxins in our body. So our podium in third place, we have the smiling iguana. Ooh. In second place, we've got the bronze yak. <laughs> and number one, holding down the coveted top spot, we have the Amazon Panda. Woo! All right. Congratulations. Cool. Good job, crew. <laughs> I'm going to change gears again. Let's get into a little bit of Q&A action to wrap up today's event. We have Mrs. Otello's grade five students joining us. I can see their faces backstage. Let's bring them in. Hey, grade fives, how are we doing today? All right, let's steal one or two questions before we take some questions from YouTube. Do you go shark diving? Yes, I, I get that asked that an awful lot. Actually, most of the time when you see a shark underwater, you're lucky to see it swimming away from you because when you're going, oh, wow, a shark, it's going, ah, a human. And they're really, really scared of us. <laughs> so they're not like aggressive the way we see in Shark Week and Jaws and stuff like that. They're, they're you know, yes, they are hunting, eating machines, but they're not very interested in us. <laughs> All right. If you got another one on deck, we'll take it before we grab a few from YouTube. And then we'll probably come back your way at the end and we'll let you sneak in maybe one or two more. Just a reminder to the classrooms who are tuning in. The camera spots are so easy to join in. Follow a link with Google Chrome. It takes you right into your camera spot. And you're only on camera for a few minutes when you're getting a chance to ask uh, your speaker some live questions. So I'll put out another email today and see if we can get a few more camera classrooms for some of our upcoming events. Okay, we're ready for you. Um, what was the most dangerous species you ever um, came across? Hmm, the most dangerous thing. Um, that's tough. I think maybe um, the blue ring octopus um, from Australia. It's a very small octopus, but they have a very, very um, deadly toxin um, if you ever got bitten by one that would not be good <laughs> all right we're going to tuck you backstage grade fives and we'll come back your way but let's get a few questions here from youtube so our first one here is from blessed sacrament and they would like to know uh the muscles that use that lure are they a species of muscles that people eat uh interestingly it, more often we eat uh, saltwater mussels, which are different and they don't um, reproduce in the same way, interestingly. Um, but some people still eat freshwater mussels, but because they're a filter feeding organism, they can bioaccumulate toxins within their flesh. And so uh, for that reason, a lot of people stay away from eating filter feeding organisms. Okay, great question. Uh, Alessandra, she's at Holy Angels and she would like to know, you know, can pollution kind of throw an entire ecosystem off balance? 
Oh, absolutely. We, you know, when I was a kid, they used to say, um, this, the answer to pollution is dilution, meaning they thought that you could just pour it in the lakes and the oceans and it would just dilute and it wouldn't be a problem much in the way you would, you know, wash something dirty off your driveway or whatever. But what we've learned now is that that's not the case, that um, not only are our oceans warming, for instance, but they're getting more acidic, they're getting more and more plastic in them. Um, so it is possible to contaminate entire water bodies, um, like oceans and lakes. And everything we do on the surface of the earth can be returned to us to drink or deal with in our water systems because everything soaks into the ground and groundwater moves from higher elevations to lower elevations, eventually taking all that stuff to water bodies. So it's really important to have kind of a holistic approach to um, being an environmental advocate and thinking about what you do both on the land and in the water to keep it clean. Yeah, we, we think... I think sometimes we forget our planet isn't as big as we think it is, especially with so many people on it. I was just interviewing a scientist the other day about how so many people are, are looking towards sequestering carbon in the ocean, uh, but not really looking at the impacts that that could potentially have. And even though the ocean is really big, there's a lot of potential impacts that could be had. So we, it is so important that we have people like yourself going out and exploring, collecting data, that we have scientists and researchers looking at it to really find out what some of the things we're doing, you know, the impacts mm -hmm. actually are having. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have to go to Naheem. Naheem is joining us uh, from St. Dominic, and they are wondering about telling the difference between the gender of muscles. That easy to do, hard to do. It's hard. I had to learn last summer because of counting all these muscles, but, but uh, like female muscles have a bigger belly, it turns out. <laughs> so they're actually like a little fatter. And some of the different species are, are more difficult. And not all muscle species have males and females. But um, I'm slowly learning how to how to pick them out pretty reliably. All right. Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're going to go to a few questions here about diving in general. Mm -hmm. um, so uh grade eight student saint boniface would like to know what are some of the best places you've been diving well if i had only one place to dive in the world it would be canada because i think it's spectacular we have so much from the west coast to the east coast the arctic to the great lakes uh, we have it all here it's fantastic uh, but it's sometimes nice to get into some pretty warm water so going down to places like the Bahamas. I, I do a fair bit of work in the caves down there. That's a good place to go. Absolutely. Great sharks in the Bahamas too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, Mrs. Otel is fifth graders. If you're there and you want to ask another question or two, just pop your camera on and that'll be my signal to come back to you guys and we'll get another couple questions, but we do still have more coming in via YouTube. So keep those questions coming. We still have a few minutes. Um, let's go to, oh, never mind. Here's our grade fives. Then we'll do a couple YouTube questions. So, uh, what was the, um, coolest thing you have seen while uh, like swimming in the ocean? Mm, that's a tough question. I've been so fortunate to have amazing, like marine life experiences, like swimming with sea lions in, in British Columbia, for instance. Um, but the coolest maybe was also the coldest was I went and was the first person to cave dive inside an iceberg down in Antarctica. So uh, the water was so cold, minus uh, 1.8, so cold that one tenth of a degree colder and it would be frozen solid. But I got to swim inside this iceberg and explore it for the first time. All right. I was hoping you would share that example. I was going to bring it up anyways, <laughs> but that is a very, very wild, pretty incredible. And icebergs aren't always stable. Sometimes they no. <laughs> and turn and move around. So yeah. that must have been something. Uh, do we have one more there? Can we steal one more from our grade fives? And then we will jump back to YouTube to wrap things up. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Sorry now. Do you guys go diving in like tight holes? 
So do we go uh, diving in tight spaces, like in yeah. inside caves? Yeah. So sometimes some of the spaces that I swim through are like as small as squeezing underneath the chairs in your classroom. But some caves are so big that I could put your entire school inside the cave. And that means I wouldn't even be able to see the walls, the floor, or the ceiling when I'm swimming through that space. So um, caves can be really small and they can be enormous too. Great question. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mrs. Otella's fifth grade class. Give us a big wave there. Thank you so much for those great questions today uh, and being on camera for us. It is great to see your faces. I see some dabs going on in the background. Yeah. Excited crew we've got there. Very cool. All right. Uh, a couple more to wrap up from YouTube here. So, um, okay. This is interesting. Miss uh, Lax crew is joining us. They're a virtual crew from St. Anne's and mm -hmm. they would like to know, um, about conditions in Canada underwater. How do they compare to other places you've been diving? I love it here. I absolutely love it here. So I think, I mean, the shipwrecks in Newfoundland are some of the most beautiful in the world because they're just covered with marine life. Um, out West, I think uh, it's so beautiful and healthy. I'm actually going there on Sunday. So I'm uh, headed out there to go swim with some sea lions and hopefully some giant Pacific octopus. Um, and then even the Great Lakes, it's beautiful. So if you're as young as 10, you can start your diving career and uh, get qualified as an open water diver. And there's lots of dive shops in Toronto um, where you can start that journey. You do a little bit of online learning, a little bit of classroom time, some pool sessions, and then off out into the world, probably in the Great Lakes, uh, to do four open water dives to become qualified. So I encourage you if you think you want to give it a try. All right. My little guy Finn turned 10 this year. So this summer, if he's up for it, we are definitely going to get him into the water and and, and trying it out at one of those places. Fantastic. Uh, I think he'll like it. He enjoys snorkeling. So I have a feeling yeah. he'll like this too. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Miss Zambri's crew is wondering about the training. Mm -hmm. What's the training like? What does it take to be able to, to explore some of the places you have? Yeah. So that class that I was just describing is what we call the open water scuba qualification. And that's just step one or class one. Um, but to continue training, you need to sort of get into deeper environments and darker environments. And when we go deeper or when we go inside caves, we need to do what we call technical diving, which means carrying a lot more equipment because there's nobody there that you can call for help once you're inside a cave, which means you have to have like at least two, if not three of everything with you to deal with emergencies. So for me, it's a lifetime commitment to training. I have um, dived for over 30 years, but I still take classes when I want to learn a new technique or a new type of equipment. And I always practice the skills that I learned in earlier classes so that I can stay on top of my game. All right. And some of the equipment you use is pretty incredible. You touched on rebreathers. So mm -hmm. students are used to seeing scuba divers, the bubbles coming up, that the you know, mm. one tank on the back. Can you tell us a little bit about uh rebreathers? Sure. So rebreathers, that's that really sort of complicated looking equipment that I I dive to uh to go underwater. And it's very similar to what an astronaut wears for a spacewalk. So when a normal scuba diver goes diving, they wear a single tank on their back, they inhale, and then they make bubbles. But for me, I'm actually capturing those bubbles. I'm recirculating them or recycling them, taking the carbon dioxide out and then adding little injections of oxygen to make up for what my body has metabolized. And when I go deep, very deep underwater, we have to really do some strange manipulations to the breathing mix to make it work. Like we actually breathe helium when we're deep. We still have some oxygen, but... Um, but we use helium to make up the mass of some of what we're breathing. So it's, it sounds a little complicated, but it enables us to go very deep and very far and conserve our gas because we're capturing all those bubbles and using them again. All right. Well, let's talk about those two books in the corner. I read yeah. Into the Planet. It is such a great, uh, you know, biography collection of, of, of journeys and stories. Uh, tell us about them. Oh, yeah. Well, Into the Planet is the book about my life as a cave diver and all the places that I've had to 
to a chance to go to and all the work that I've done. But it's also a little bit about fear because I'm not fearless. <laughs> I'm afraid all the time because what I do is really dangerous and I want to do it safely and with other people that want to do it safely. So that's into the planet. But the Aquanaut here is my book for younger kids, probably six to eight ish or four to eight ish. Um, and that's just, uh, again, kind of following my life and how the things that I thought about wanting to do as a child, I could turn into a reality in this very strange career that I have today. All right. Final question here from YouTube, Jill. Expeditions. What are some of the longest you've been on expedition for? Oh boy. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm going for months to a place. Like when I went to Antarctica to cave dive inside the icebergs, that was, that was a, a few months on, on that project. And then sometimes we just do things that are a few weeks or we go many trips where we'll do a couple of weeks and then a couple of weeks and a couple of weeks and move around and go back to a place to study things that are changing. Um, so it depends. Um, uh, the next things that I have coming up are all less than a month long. So that means that I can be home during the nice summer weather. Home quite a, a little bit. bit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, Jill, before we let you go, I want to give a shout out to our classrooms today. Thank you so much for joining us to our classrooms. I know there will be a ton of classrooms watching later today and later this week. I will send an email after this event with the link to the Kahoot. So you can play the Kahoot with your students right in the classroom. Uh, and you can still take part in that way. Huge shout out to Edwin for uh, pulling all the links together, making sure that classes know what's happening when, putting together some great teacher travel kits that you can use throughout uh, this trip as we make our way across Canada. So coming up, stop number three, studying polar bears in the Arctic uh, with Elisa McCall will be April 4th at one o'clock Eastern. So head over to... This link that I have up here, I'll share it as well in the email I send later. Um, you can find the full itinerary, student travel logs, and some great curriculum material from Edwin. Jill, thank you so much for being with us today. It is always a pleasure to steal some of your time. You are always on the coolest adventures around the world, but looking also right back here at our waters in Canada. Thank you so much for taking us on that journey today. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. We're going to sign off for today, everyone. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you for some polar bear action.